Good morning, everybody. I'm going to talk about governance, which in an open organization is a tricky thing because it's often a, scene, a thing to be like, it's a, like a ball of red tape that needs to be cut through or like something you need to seek an exception for, uh, something you need to work around or like that kind of thing. So like what are leaders or like future leaders here to do in such an environment? Um, how do you convince people that a governing body imposing a little order on a bunch of unstructured data might be in their best interest? Um, it might even be something supportive for them later on. What I'm going to try to do is, is uh, as a backdrop to all of this, I'm going to explain how Red Hat got a community started, um, basically managing our JIRA instance. And from that, I'm going to try to express uh, a bunch of lessons for you guys on how to build them yourself uh, so that you can do the same thing. So um, I'm going to share a little bit about our JIRA instance first as sort of like, uh, I'm, I'm going to submit it to you guys like, uh, as evidence that what I'm talking about is not a bunch of made up crap. You can actually get to like, really positive business outcomes. And it, it does work, actually. Um, so issues.redhat.com is our instance. Um, it's got, it was born out of four JIRA server instances consolidated down into one data center. It's not as big as Fidelity's, but it still is like the bread and butter of, um, it's like a, like a centerpiece, a critical part of Red Hat's um, work tracking systems. It's got more than 15,000 users on it. 10,000 of them are Red Hat associates. Uh, 5,000 or so are upstream people because it's a public instance. Um, 850 projects are standardized. 1,470, I think, um, are active. And then 500 plus are inactive. So we're like, as of like the last week or so, I think we just maybe crossed over 2,000 projects total in the instance. Every product we sell has its development uh, work tracked in there to some extent. So it's not just like a small instance with a couple of things in there. This is like the core of, uh, of what we do is tracked there. Eight full-time admins, 15 of which we've kind of farmed out to other organizations. So like Enterprise Linux has a JIRA admin, OpenShift has an Enterprise admin, and, uh, JIRA admin, and so on. And it's public. A little bit here, um, the community-defined standards um, were put together by this governing body. So I'm talking about like the governance of that instance. Um, community defined standards there, that mess there says uh, executive sponsorships. We, we've had executive sponsorship, but we never had like a mandate or an edict to kind of help us along and say, you are the authority that can figure out how this is going to be governed. It's all community driven. That's like a byproduct of working in an open organization. Um, we use rubrics for introducing new standards. We have 8,000 or so associates represented in this governing body. I'm not saying 8,000 people go to it. It's just that you know, they have representatives uh, expressing their interests um, and clear voting rules and regulations. A happy byproduct of this um, governing body is that we've increased associates' influence. We've increased their visibility. Um, the folks that are contributing to here, you know, they're representing large organizations, sometimes hundreds or thousands of people. So we connected them with a lot of different uh, team leads and architects and Jira uh, project admins and so on to kind of give them a lot more visibility across their space. So we've kind of, in some ways, we've accelerated their career development. I will remember when our group was really starting to get uh, going. We started three years ago. Um, when it was really starting to get going, um, managers were reaching out to me and asking, like, hey, my, my associates are, like, contributing to this thing. Like, what should they be doing? Like, what, what comes next? Like, they, they're starting to write like their own goals in there, and their managers don't know what to do with them. Um, so I could help like, add a couple of contacts. That was really validating um, at that time. Before going too far, I need a show of hands. When I say open organization, do you guys know what I'm talking about? Are you familiar with that concept? This is foreign. OK, I saw like, a couple of these. OK. An open organization is those five things on the screen up there. There might be different intensities to it. Like Some organizations might be more inclusive. Some might be more collaborative or whatever. But those five facets are always present. It's a highly participatory environment. If the, like the mailing list and the chat rooms have like tons of people in there, there's not a lot, of, it's not hierarchical, there's not a lot of boundaries. When people are having conversations, you will get input from directors and senior directors treated on equal footing as content coming from like junior engineers that were just hired. If, you're, if you heard concepts like, um, like a term like a meritocracy or a phrase like, may the best ideas win kind of thing, like that kind of encapsulates what, how those discussions play out. It's just a lot of conversation. The benefit for this sort of thing is that decisions, when they're made, are usually very well informed, because you have a lot of different perspectives informing them from the start. Um, it does take longer to get to them, though, because there's just more discussion to get through. 
Um, the down, like when, and that's one of the downsides, kind of like social media, is that sometimes things get kind of inflammatory. Um, things get a little bit crazy. Uh, people sometimes get very passionate about something. Um, and that's just the nature of, the, of, of how, it, how it works. So that's an open organization. Um, let's talk about origins here. So this is, I'm going to describe how the governing body got started three years ago. Um, so if you have like something in mind in your company that needs order, standardization, governance, policy, that kind of stuff, but you're not really sure how to get started, um, I've got you covered because that's, that's how I felt three years ago. So I'm going to walk through that a little bit. Like I said, we were consolidating four JIRA server instances down into one data center instance. And we knew going into it that if we just took it as is, it would basically not work. Um, we had too much configuration sprawl across those instances. Um, and working with Atlassian, they kind of told us, like, you're going to be firefighting and having performance issues, like, constantly if you guys really do this. So you need to figure out, like, what, you can, what configuration you can jettison to get into, like, a more stable instance. Technically, we kind of knew what schemes and things like that we wanted to have, but the challenge was like, which ones should we pick? Which ones really matter here? Which ones do we want to promote? Which ones do we want to reject? That kind of stuff. How do we figure that out? I was the service architect at the time, so I was responsible for figuring out how to deploy it, and we put it on, we containerized it, we put it on OpenShift, and, but that's a, a presentation for another day. Um, but there wasn't like someone I could look to or an organization I could look to that would handle like the governance of it. And you might say, like, well, Jay, like, if you have the JIRA admins, like, why don't the admin just do it? Well, we're in an open organization here. At the time, we had 30, 40, 50 admins, and they were all over the organization. They weren't in one centralized place. So if, like, we could make standards and mandate things, but, like, the other admins aren't going to care, so we, how do we get that? How do we handle that, right? There wasn't any one place that I could look to handle and basically come up with, the, like, own the governance or own the policy that we had to put together. I'm going to try to like, summarize that environment in an insightful quote full of uh, wisdom here for you. You ever been in, in an environment like this, right? Like, where people will just kind of commiserate about a problem? Everybody knows it's a problem, but they'll be like, eh, you know, they'll, they'll cover it up with like a platitude. It's like, eh, you know, it's never a dull moment here, whatever. You know, it's just the way it is. It drives me nuts. Um, so, at the time, I started looking around to figure out where are the passionate people that can help in this space? Who, who has opinions about this, but maybe is reluctant to do something about it or has reservations about it? Who, who are those people? And maybe can I like, ignite them, uh, and ignite their passion in this space, try to get them more interested? Kind of wormed my way around the organization, uh, meeting people, and eventually I got led to a existing uh, working group, and they were called the opinionated JIRA, I'm sorry, the opinionated Agile and JIRA group. And they were um, doing like JIRA vocabulary, basically, or like Agile vocabulary. It's like, what is a feature? What is the definition of done? What, what does close really mean? Like more like abstract kind of things, not JIRA specific. Um, that group was meeting once a month, and in my opinion, it's a little bit judgy, but like their output was a little bit anemic because they would spend, you know, when you're meeting monthly, they would spend like the first half of the meeting just like talking about what they talked about like a month ago, because nobody remembers. So it was doing OK, but it was still going to be the catalyst of what was to come. I needed to pivot that group over to something, in my opinion, that was a little bit more focused and a little bit more productive. So here's my advice on how to pivot a working group when you're trying to get started. If you don't find, if you're like looking around to try to get a group together to solve, to come up with a governing body, you can still build one from scratch. What I ended up doing, though, was finding one that already existed and trying to kick off from there. The way to approach that that I, um, that I picked was I worked with the working group facilitator, the leader first. I pulled them aside in a one-on-one, -on -one and I was like, look, what you're working on is important, but there's this much bigger problem coming. Like, whatever you guys agree on, it's not going to matter if our work tracking system, like, doesn't work. So, you know, maybe we can kind of share the leadership here. Maybe we can share, like, I didn't dump the problems on her at the time. I worked together to come up with, like, kind of a new focus come up with objectives, come up with goals, come up with short, uh, short-term deliverables, that kind of stuff. Thankfully, she was really enthusiastic about it. Um, she was actually just being the facilitator at the time. She's like, because nobody else wanted to facilitate, so I was just kind of doing it as a service. And I was like, well, great, OK. I'll, I'll happily take over if you'll let me. And that, the rest is kind of history. Um, but my advice is to offer, sh to share the leadership there. Um, don't come in like an alarmist in the middle of their meeting, because nobody likes that. 
Um, don't try to like ambush people with like much bigger concerns or something and try to pivot like in, in flight or like in the middle of a, of a meeting. Don't like disrupt an existing agenda. Start from the side and kind of build, build the vision together. Once you do that, prep in advance. The agenda that we were putting together, we, you know, we called out goals, objectives, next steps, blah, blah, blah. But then we were like, okay, who, who would be our allies in this space? Who would, think, who would agree with this and who would, res who would it resonate with and who would it not resonate with? In other words, who would be our allies and who would be our opponents here? We didn't have to do this, but if you, if you in your organization have like particularly loud people that you need to deal with, maybe have a one-on-one -on -one with them first and kind of like warm them up to the, the idea so they don't like let their emotions get a hold of them mid-meeting and then like derail what you're trying to get across. Prep in advance. And then lastly, when, once you have your agenda together for that new direction, that new kickoff, I would say sell it like an action movie. An action movie doesn't start with a big preamble, a big walk through the structure, go through all the scope, go through all these requirements that we're gonna do. It gets you like right in the thick of it from the start, right? Like you will, like when a James Bond film starts up or when a uh, Mission Impossible film starts up, like they're already in a mission in there and you're just like learning like what's going on. Like if you sell it like that, it keeps people way more engaged. They're like glued to their screens while you're listening. Another piece of advice I heard um, actually leading up to this was don't create a presentation that you yourself wouldn't want to sit through. One of the early deliverables we had to come up with for our group, I'm gonna use the term now, it's OJA. Um, so we changed OAJ, the Opinionated Agile and JIRA, to OJA, Opinionated JIRA and Agile group, switching the A and the J. So now, because we were focusing on JIRA, that was one reason, OJA, yep. Um, and then, but it's also easier to say, and it's like a silly like marketing trick there, because I wanted this to be top of mind whenever anybody was touching the JIRA instance or was thinking about changing something in there, I'd be like, oh, I gotta talk to the OJA people. That's what we were going for. Anyway, our early deliverables here was like, we were coming up with a communication model. OJA would settle, would, would meet regularly, and they would figure out what um, schemes, what configuration artifacts, what rubrics were allowed in the instance to govern it. They would, we would create like packets of information, like almost like a leaflet sort of thing, and then the representatives would take that back to their organization, share it, um, get some feedback, distill it, and bring it back to OJA so we could iterate and, um, you know, iterate and uh, that would be the feedback loop basically. So we had to set um, a decision model. It was like the next thing we had to get to for our governing body. We had early deliverables put together, and it's really important that you have those early deliverables and make forward progress. Once that's going on, you need to start making decisions about like, what, that con like, what, the, what you're going to be governing, um, what standards you're going to impose, like that kind of stuff. Like uh, I was in, when I was introduced, I have 14 years experience inside an open organization. I worked for Red Hat. Um, their, our previous CEO, I think, wrote the book on what an open organization is, so I feel like I kind of know, this is the one part that I kind of know really well. I've always, I've seen benevolent dictators and democracies usually are the, one, the things that last the longest when, when a governing body is running its course. OJ has been around for more than three years at this point. Um, it started at a, as a benevolent dictator, as myself and a co-lead um, were kind of like jointly sharing the leadership there. And if you guys are thinking about starting a governing body, like, benevolent dictator might be you just to kind of like get the group together, maybe be the facilitator. If you got the right soft skills, if you got the right you know, personality for it, like it can work really, really well. Typically though, after a governing body's been around for a while, either it starts, at, if it didn't start at a democracy, it usually ends up in that way. Um, it doesn't have to be like the winner take all kind of voting that like the US has for its elections. It can be different kind of votes too, like if you do approval votes or like rank choice or um, like fist to, fist to five kind of stuff is popular. Those can all work out in your favor too. Another point is that you don't have to have perfect procedure from the beginning. Like if you're just starting out and it's just like a small ragtag group of people, benevolent dictator is probably fine. Then you can get to a more formal democracy. As a governing body matures, it will, it will naturally introduce more rules and regulations as time goes on. So when you pivot a working group, you're gonna start with the good, the stuff on the uh, light side here on the, on the, on the left. Progress has probably been made already because they're operating in an adjacent space. The members probably already know each other. Hopefully you have healthy team dynamics. Um, the interest and the passion should already be there. Um, people can, you know, will be friendly. But the downside, of course, is there's a lot of downsides when you uh, start this way that have to be addressed. For one, like I mentioned, it was a monthly meeting at the time. We increased that to weekly, and it was two hours long with a break in between, of course. That was 
tricky, right? When we first did that, a third of the group fell away. And it was because OJA had become something different than what they had signed up for. One, it actually had tangible deliverables and people had to do work. Two, it was that there were people that, you know, they were passionate about it and getting into it, but there were others that were just there for, like as a curiosity, or like they were just there to like kind of hang out and watch what was going on. It just turned into something that they weren't interested in anymore, and that, that's okay. The 11 or 12 or so people that we had left there, though, they were highly motivated, but individually there were still challenges. Maybe they lacked visibility. Maybe they lacked confidence, like they didn't have the personality for it. Um, they weren't comfortable taking these things and presenting it in front of a 400 person, person organization that they're representing. Um, Maybe they represented too much or too little. We had one person that was representing a thousand person strong organization. And I don't care how good you are at, or say you are at distilling people's feedback, nobody is good enough, <laughs> no one person is good enough to distill a thousand people's worth of feedback into something constructive. We had to build out their contact network further into their, uh, so that they could like tear it out. Um, similarly, we had someone that was representing a 400 person organization, but they only really knew how 50 of them worked because that's, that's who they worked with day to day. The rest of the org was kind of like a black box to them. So we had to build out their contact network in that direction too. So there was still a lot of like individual challenges. So earlier we talked about um, building build, or pivoting the working group. Now I'm talking about pivoting the individual people to set them up to, for success. We want them to be ver your best representatives that they can be so they can effectively communicate your constituents' interests. Can't set someone up for success without knowing what it means to be successful. So we had to define our roles next. And what I usually see is that you have representatives in a governing body, and then you also have consultants in a governing body. The representatives are the ones that have voting power, and they're the ones that have skin in the game. If they vote for a measure, or like agree to approve some, some measure, it's implying that they will also advocate for it, and they will also be a big um, like proponent of it and like help ripple it out. So their votes, that, that's why they get that voting power is because they have skin in the game. The consultants, on the other hand, don't have voting power, but they are way, they're more knowledgeable, right? They have plenty of, plenty of experience or insights to offer. A common pattern that we would see is you would have representatives who maybe didn't see everything or know everything about their organization, so then they would bring in one to three consultants into the group too and fill out the rest of their understanding. There would still only be one vote for a given organization, and if a particularly loud or opinionated consultant had um, opinions, they'd have to route it through the representative and get them on their side to vote in their favor too. Like they'd have to reconcile those differences. So once you know what, these, what everybody is expected to do, you can start talking about pivoting those people. Um, I'm gonna echo something that uh, James Cameron had said a couple nights ago, but using different words. Every person, every human you interact with is a unique perspective with a unique history that got to that perspective. So as a coach or as a community leader, it's really helpful to, like for me, I try to consider them each like a unique challenge to figure out how to uplift them and be like an effective representative. The way you start is with a lot of one-on-ones um, to establish trust. And that trust has to be two-directional, of course. Um, you gotta ask them questions like, why, you know, why are they interested? What are they passionate about? What do they want to change? What do they want, you know, why are they interested in this governing body that you're trying to put together? Um, what are their reservations? What are they concerned about? Um, what challenges do they think are co is coming up? What sort of obstacles are ahead of them? That kind of stuff. More concretely, for OJA, I would ask a question like this. I would say, once we, once we come up with a, um, like a packet of information that we want to share, who are you going to send that to? Where's it going to go? Who do you expect to respond? If they responded with uncertainty, then that was like a red flag that we'd have to cover later. If they responded with a mailing list, which is not an accountable entity, I hate when people respond with mailing lists, it's a little pet peeve of mine, that was also a red flag that I would come back with. Um, that was really helpful in kind of figuring out like, oh, how big is this person's contact network? Where can I help kind of like expand it and help increase their visibility across? Once you have identified those gaps, then you can start talking about how to uplift them. Again, more concretely, what I, would, what I would be doing is I would reach out to other managers or other um, like team leads in their org and like try to learn who else they should be in contact with. Build out their contact network, build out their, um, you know, their friends <laughs> basically inside the org uh, so that they can be effective representatives. A byproduct of putting this together, don't worry if you can't read it, um, was something that uh, I call an influence map, which is a visualization of 
um, folks' contact networks and the organizational structures behind them. So it's like a, basically a big bubble diagram with a bunch of arrows pointing in places. If you see gaps in this map, it's like that's a topic for conversation later on. So like if you see an arrow going somewhere that implies that they don't know who runs this org or who their contact is in that org, then that's something you should have a conversation about. Maybe talk to their manager, talk to team leads, whatever. This technique is used in intelligence agencies when mapping out um, political dynamics as well, or so I'm told. Going on with making them comfortable, I mentioned one-on-ones already. If you're running, if your uh, governing body is coming together uh, and it has like a recurring larger meeting, but you get like, let's say three or four people get particularly passionate about a topic and they just keep going in circles or they're not agreeing, or in other words, the other 20 people are now bored and now like multitasking and doing something else, take them out of that environment, put them in their own working group for a bit, let them spin on that and figure out what, they, what outcome and what compromise they need to make and then bring that back to the big group. When you have a big group, especially in an open org where some people are directors and some people are like managers and some people are, are senior engineers or whatever other fancy titles they have, it's an expensive meeting, right? Like your company is like wasting money while these people, while three or four people are like spinning around on a decision. You have to keep it productive. You have to keep it valuable because people will, in my opinion, will always go where the value is when you're, when you're putting together meeting forums. So give them a safe space where they can work out their differences and then fold them back up, you know, bring them back into the fold like a week or two later or something like that. That's what I mean by um, during conflict, identify the passionate uh, participants. That's what I mean by that. This one is, sounds a little cheesy, but like breaking the ice regularly is really helpful. We had that two or that uh, two hour meeting every week. I don't know if you guys have this in your working environments, but like typically people would show up one to five minutes late in a meeting. Like we always have like this like continuous people just kind of like trickle in. And I would spend that time instead um, having like a break the ice kind of thing where we would just like share our art. We would call like artwork of the week. That's my pumpkin that I carved during the holidays or the uh, Halloween season. On the bottom is the co-lead. He's sharing his like tiger artwork because he's a, he's a painter from time to time. Um, during the, the break there, in the middle of those two hours, uh, we would have shoe of the week because a peer of mine who has this like ridiculous like network of discord bots goes out and purchases shoes when they first come out and he collects shoes. And I'm not gonna get into why, but like that was just like something that was really interesting and <laughs> kept, the, kept the team paying attention um, during, the, uh, during the breaks. If you're governing something and it has a very wide impact, you will find that the teams that you're impacting have varying capability in an open organization. Some teams for us in Ojo, some teams that we were impacting had been around for 15 years and some had been created within the last year. And so like their JIRA process, they were still finding their way, whereas the, the older teams, like their stuff was, their JIRA process was baked pretty hard. I'm mentioning this because I wanna reinforce the point that you, you the leader, have to trust your representatives. They know the team dynamics better than you ever will for the organizations that they are representing. So you have to trust them. If you don't trust them yet, or like you, you can't assume best intent, then you haven't had enough one-on-ones yet. I'm gonna go through a couple of deliverables here just to illustrate a couple more lessons. You don't have to read this, don't worry. I basically copied um, one of the rubrics we use for a new issue type. So if somebody wants a new issue type in our instance, a requester comes along, the JIRA admins will see that first and then they look at this rubric to see if it's a new instance, if, a, if we should add it or not to the instance. If it's a black and white answer, if it's a yes or no, that's fine, the JIRA admins handle that, that communication. If it's gray or they're not sure, then it gets back to the governing body to, to weigh in and, and make a decision. Here, what, what the, the lesson I wanna remind everybody is that it is super, it's like a really good synergy if you can get the representatives to, to ratify the same rubrics that they are going to use. Does that make sense? If they come up with a rubric, if you collaboratively come up with those rubrics about what is or isn't permissible in your instance, and they, say, you know, they vote for it, they now are the advocates that ripple that out. And that's just like a really good feedback loop going forward. This one here is a similar one, but it's, this is for issue type schemes, which this one you can see, I'm trying, just trying to illustrate, it's much simpler. The reason for that is in the sizing guide for um, data center, like this, the issue type schemes is not really called out there because it doesn't, having a lot of them doesn't really have a lot of performance impact. Having a lot of them is annoying for the JIRA admins, no argument about that. So you don't wanna have infinity or even or thousands or anything. But my point is you shouldn't have process for its own sake and you shouldn't be governing or have like policy for its own sake. It should be driven for some, like, by, for some reason. This seems silly like and obvious in retrospect, but 
our initial scheme for these things before we made a distinction, or sorry, our initial rubric for these things before we made a distinction between you know, issue type and issue type scheme, they were about the same length and we're like, why are we doing this? Um, so keep that in mind when you're designing process and policy. We're back to a big one here. This is for new statuses. It's an excerpt of a larger document for workflows. What we found when requests were coming in is people were okay with the JIRA statuses that we had, like the definitions we had defined, but they just didn't like the name. They just wanted to change the name of it. And it was, that was such a frequent thing that we heard that we're like, we, the governing body, were like, can we just like ban renames? We, should we just do that? We don't want to be like Oja the, the thesaurus. So we did. We had everybody like agree. They were like, we're not going to talk about changing uh, status names anymore. We're just going to go with the ones that we have. And we put that in the rubric. And then the representatives reminded everybody that this, was the, this is what the rubric is when they took that back to their um, constituents. It's powerful to share and be to share those rubrics and be very transparent about them because that's what the requesters will see and now they can make a decision. They can look at it and be like, oh, this is the criteria that my request is being judged by. And they might see that maybe it's not gonna pass muster and they're just like, all right, I'm not gonna get it, I understand. But if they're passionate about it and they feel strongly about it, then their response is to try to meet that criteria or at least form arguments. Whether or not those arguments are productive, I'm not gonna say, but like, it's important to note that they are now at least putting together more context for you and making your initial interactions more productive from the start. You don't have to have like a bunch of ticket feedback loops going back and forth trying to get on the same page because they can see what they're being judged by and they can answer or like proactively tell you what, what, why they think they need these things. Once your governing body is really starting to get off the ground, it might be time, like it's got its own like self-sustaining momentum, it might be time to start spreading, spreading the good word. The way I would recommend doing that is uh, putting together what I call a pitch deck. It's like maybe 10 to 12 slides, and it describes what your governing body is about, the value it provides, how to engage with it is really important, um, like what are the next steps, like that kind of stuff. Put together your pitch deck, and then find like the forums and the soapboxes that you need to proclaim it from. For us, there was like an agile craft sort of thing, um, agile forum that, that I lectured about. There was a project management community of practice um, that I lectured about. There were senior leaders reaching out to me because uh, they started to hear like rumors about OJA getting bigger and bigger. And they're like, what is this OJA thing? It sounds like you guys are gonna create an ivory tower and tell my associates like <clears throat> how life is gonna be in, in JIRA. So I'd be brought in with like that uh, dark stormy cloud over me. And then I would answer like, no, no, we, there might be an ivory tower, but the front door is unlocked and anybody is allowed to come in and start like putting together policy together with us. So it's not as scary as you think. Like, Get, you can use these pitch decks as like a recruitment exercise. Sometimes you can flip it like that. Um, they're, like, that's what I did with uh, at least two staff meetings where they came in, they're like, oh, just scary, tell us what's gonna happen. I'm like, well, why don't you just actually send some delegates and we can like loop them in and they'll, they'll read you into what's going on here. And we filled out more of our representation that way. And again, like I said before, once you have your pitch deck together and you're out there lecturing, sell it like an action movie. Keep them glued to their virtual screens. It was from May, no, sorry, from August 2020 to November of 2020 that uh, we were, that was the two hour long weekly meetings and that was all designed. We had like a sea of JIRA schemes that we had to get through and we were designing out how we were going to figure out what stays and what doesn't and that was mercifully not that long. <laughs> Back then it felt long, but like it was only a, couple, a few months. When we got to full operation here, this was in January of 2021, now we're at the point where it's like, okay, now we have to start like imposing this stuff out there. Um, this, was, this was the tricky part, but like all the representatives had already been communicating this stuff out and warning their, their constituents that this is what was coming. Um, so this is like some guidance for your governing body once it is in full swing. You wanna, re this goes for not just the leader, but also for like everybody that's participating. You don't have ivory towers, or if you do, you can use like the front door analogy if you like that better. Um, Always be welcoming feedback and meet the requesters where they are. At Red Hat and probably most open organizations, everybody shows up and starts acting like it's a, like they need the exception. Like they're the special one, they're the exception. Like literally every team starts with that conversation like that. And you need to flip it from how do I get an exception to how do I get supported? And there are many ways to meet them in the middle when you do that. Um, like I said, if they make a request and it's a black or white, you know, a yes or no kind of thing with a rubric, Maybe that's how it plays out. But there can be more gray areas. For example, if someone wants a new workflow, we might respond and say something like, okay, 
we, we'll, we're looking at it, but here's what we're gonna meet in the middle first. You're, we'll give you the workflow that you want, but you're gonna use the statuses that we picked out. So you're gonna rename these three, for example. And you give them something in the middle and say like, okay, this is what you get for the next like three months or whatever. Then when your team has more appetite for change, or when, you know, when that time expires, then we'll move you on like a little bit further, closer to compliance. So it's like a, almost like a series kind of uh, steps that we would take. Exceptions can exist, but I would say that the governing body should be aware of them and decide when they should be approved. It should not fall on an individual representative to decide if, the, if there's an exception or not. They have to work with the rest of the community and get consensus to do it. I mentioned this a little bit in the beginning. You can iterate on procedure as well. When you're rolling this stuff out and you're getting folks to you know, adopt your standards or get compliant with your, um, your governing body, it's okay to start very, very simple and work with the teams that you know, are, are enthusiastic about it and then iterate on procedure and get more and more structured about it and how you roll out afterwards. And when I say procedure, I mean like how the agenda is put together, how decisions are made, um, how, things are, how uh, decisions are proposed, um, that kind of stuff. If you're designing from scratch like OJA did when we had that sea of uh, schemes to deal with, I would say start with a green field first, your perfect vision about how everything should be governed, and then let reality settle in and set the constraints. So figure out your vision first and then figure out what's actually possible. Um, move that needle there. I'm gonna summarize that one by saying, don't fight every single battle, and I made its own slide for it, which I just teased a moment ago. Do not fight every single battle. Like, especially if you have a very wide impact, you might get a request that comes in for, that represents like five people's interests, and then you might get another one that's representing like 50 or 500 people's interests. That five one, that could probably wait, right? Or it could be like, here you have this temporary thing that we're just gonna throw together in like 10 minutes. Just, you guys live with that for a little while, we will get back to you later. We're right now gonna deal with this much bigger one that's, that has come in. Sometimes, um, if you do get a big one that comes in like that, actually, um, I should credit, like internally, OpenShift did this. They, they set a whole bunch of standards up like within their organization first, which is like you know, you know, several hundred people. And they're like, hey, Oja, this is what we wanna use. And we're like, well, that's not really compliant, however, you just got 800 people to be using a standard here, and I'm okay with that. We just didn't think of it. Like, it wasn't a big deal to kind of add that stuff into the catalog of, of things. Sometimes people will do the work for you. But yeah, don't, do it, don't fight every battle. Not fighting every battle implies that you know what, that you've prioritized what matters most, so I'll talk a little bit about that. When, this is a little bit tricky. When we were first consolidating the instance, we had like bazillions of, like thousands of statuses, thousands of custom fields. We knew there's a whole bunch of stuff that we had to throw away first. So we would look for the things that we knew weren't be supportive. So like super complicated workflows, just like we called them works of art. There was like works of art out there. They're like, there's no way we can maintain this thing. Get it out of here. Like that kind of stuff we would cut away. But then we were left with an instance that was stable, but not really maintainable. It was still a nightmare behind the scenes for the admins to kind of keep going. There's still tons of schemes and stuff like that in there. So it was like within operational limits, but it was still a mess. The next thing that we thought about was like, okay, what are the strategic investments or like the strategic initiatives that Red Hat is going after where we know portfolio management and program management want to report like how well that's going? That's the stuff we should standardize on first. We should make sure those groups of, of those, those teams standardize and adopt this stuff first so that those guys can do their job and we can keep track of like what we're doing as a company here. So we prioritize that up. And as we did that as a group, that wasn't me, the, that wasn't us, the, the co-leads, deciding what the priorities were. That was us ratifying that within the governing body and deciding what mattered to us. That way, when the representatives would get new requests coming in, they would see that a request would come in and be like, oh, this is for, this is for a product that maybe has really high revenue and is high impact, or one that's, you know, is it tied to these strategic things we were talking about here? They could prioritize how important the request was based on that criteria. So prioritize what matters most. That's gonna vary from like governing body to governing body and company to company. So I can't really give you good advice there um, like in a generic way. Your governing body should agree on lines that can't be crossed. For us, that was uh, the health and, uh, and stability of the instance. If somebody requested a plugin or they wanted another work of art, mm -mm, we, we weren't gonna have it. And we would decide that and agree on that as a group, right? We had. 20 or so representatives at the time, we were, getting, we were flirting with that 8,000 level constituency. Um, and we would just kind of unify on that front. For softer lines though, I mentioned momentum earlier, but for softer lines where things are grayer, I wanna talk about this little uh, support spectrum thing on the right here. 
I'll call them configuration artifacts in, or maybe schemes or something. Like our JIRA instance had a whole bunch of stuff in, in it after we had done that initial consolidation from four server instances. There were some things we wanted to promote. There were some, some workflows or some schemes, whatever, that we wanted to promote and make sure people saw. That's what I'm calling promoted in, in, in here. Or, so like that'd be stuff that's like the default or like starred or like just like really bright presentation, that's what you would get. A recommended configuration artifact might be something that falls just below that. It's okay if people use it and they're allowed to. Like, it'll be documented, it might be in like a menu drop down or whatever. Um, but that's what, that's like the next tier. Below that is accepted. You might not socialize that configuration artifact all that much, but if the trend continues to go up, if more people use it, that's fine. The next two, accepted and tolerated, those are where we're, talk, where we're talking about like reducing it. So like for the schemes in our JIRA instance that we wanted to get rid of, we would say we were tolerating some of them or we were marginalizing others. A tolerated one, is, you, you know, it's not like public facing, it's not something that would be shown in like our documentation out to all the constituents. Um, it was still in the instance, we just wouldn't say anything about it because we wanted the adoption or like the usage of them to, to either stay flat or go down. Marginalized, the difference between marginalized and tolerated is that we were actively working to get people off them. That was the kind of thing like if we created a custom thing just for a moment to help people to meet in the middle and help them get through, we would say like in three months we're getting rid of this. So you can use this for now, but you gotta get your teams educated on, what's, on the, like what comes next or something. That's a marginalized scheme. And then rejected is like what we did at the beginning where there's a whole bunch of like, no, we can't have these. We, can, we can't have these because it's gonna destabilize the whole instance and no one project or one team is worth destabilizing the whole instance, nobody's that valuable. When we pivoted from all that design work into the, the operational work, we had two bodies that still existed. We had a standard, we called it OGIS standards was one, and they would meet every, at the last Wednesday of every month um, and go through anything that had come to the JIRA admins and seemed like a gray area when it was passing through the rubrics, that's what the standards group would review. They would look through that, make some decisions, and then pass that back down to a different group called OJA Core. OJA Core was a separate, um, you could think of it as like OJA's like scrum team almost. Um, it's like the execution arm. So after a decision was made by the standards body, it would roll back to the core group and they would, do, they would make like the documentation updates, the rubric updates or whatever, um, and then help the teams adopt whatever decision was made um, or give them the bad news if, if their request was declined. So we can get to the summary here. If you gotta start a governing body in an open organization, find the passionate people first. You could do that by pivoting a working group like I did or you could start with your, your own working group by identifying the passionate people and giving them some clear goals and deliverables and then listening about what their reservations are, why they can't get started. Um, if it's a time kind of thing, like they have, everybody starts with a day job and they have the things that they're already paid to do. So maybe it's, it starts with a conversation about, with their manager about like, how do you free up 10% of their time? How do you get them four hours or three, two hours, whatever is needed, week over week so that they can spend a little bit of time in this and then grow that back up you know, or expand that out over time, that kind of thing. Um, have those clear goals and deliverables ready. Build a foundation, comes after that. After you've got your working group kicked off, create roles so that, you under, so that everybody understands what the expectations are, come up with the right decision model for now, and again, you can iterate on that a couple of times if you need to, um, and then put together that influence map so you can figure out where the gaps are in your, in your representation. Um, another thing I forgot to mention earlier, the influence map can actually be used for another reason, which is to illustrate how much impact your governing body has. So if you've got like a big chart that's got like a ton of names and a ton of organizations represented, that's really helpful to show like your governing body actually has some momentum behind it and it has a bunch of like buy-in um, to kind of like sell the idea that you know, you're starting to get successful and you're starting to get, get things moving. Um, if you're in a more hostile environment where there are other like competing interests or other governing bodies out there, because I've been in that too, Sometimes having an influence map there is, is helpful because you can use that as like almost like a club and be like, I understand you guys came up with some standards over here, but like here's what the rest of the company is doing. So now you guys need to join the fold here and figure out how they get, like sell it, like how they get involved. Growing your community, again, reminding everybody that there's no ivory towers and make sure you meet requesters where they are and then always be welcoming that feedback. Find your soapboxes and get out there um, to share the good word um, and get, um, you know, basically spread out, spread the, spread the uh, word. And then finally, you can pivot towards execution if it's the type of uh, governing thing where like, you had to do a bunch of design first and then roll that out, then get to um, pivoting execution there. So focusing on the needle, making sure it's moving, don't fighting every battle, and prioritizing what matters. And that's it, easy.
I do have two minutes for questions. Um, I'm gonna walk out those doors over there so you can just follow me if you have them and you wanna ask them in person too. Um, I do wanna thank all, oh, go ahead. Can you talk more about the selling boxes and how you got the good word out as people start to feel Sure, I was asked, can I talk more about the soap boxes and how I got the good word out? I actively looked for them initially. Um, so in, inside Red Hat, we have like an internet sort of like wiki kind of thing. Um, and it has like search so you can go find other like communities of practice, um, forums, uh, basically like anybody, anybody that puts a group together um, can create like a space in like, con like using confluence terms there. They can create a space that describes what they are and what they're up to. And knowing Jira was for work tracking, I was like, okay, we use Jira for project management as well as program management. And also like it's gonna roll up for portfolio management and there's like a lot of agile practitioners that are using it as a tool to kind of control work in progress and stuff like that. So I just looked for those specific roles or those specific like interests, things that are adjacent to whatever your governing body is doing. Um, and just sharing it out there. It can be done like as a recruitment exercise if you want to fill out more, um, more representation, but I, I was doing that just so that people all had a consistent understanding of what our governing body was setting out to do to squish rumors about us coming in with a hammer and telling everyone how it's gonna be. It was more like a proactive thing to like get, to get ahead of rumors and stuff like that. Any other questions? Yeah. Good question. The question was, for non-IT or other groups that are not uh, necessarily engineering or something like that, how are they represented? I would say your governing body should decide how big their impact should be. If you're in an organization like I am for just engineering, then maybe the focus for your Jira instance is to make sure that product engineering is successful and that's, you, like, you prioritize those requests up. And so things outside that, like maybe IT or like customer support or things like that, like obviously those functions are important, but like for you as the governing body for, you know, in our instance it was JIRA, that kind of helps illustrate or helps uh, inform what your prioritization should be. Does that, does that help? Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we have like a, a, a support policy or like a support position that we've taken where if a request comes in from Red Hat Engineering, which is like the primary group we're, serv we're serving, it's 8,000 or so people, um, that would get more like design and consulting and we'd make more effort to meet in the middle. But for groups that are outside that, that organization, we would still listen to their requests, but our responses were typically more something like, you can use what is configured in JIRA right now or find another solution. The question was, can you speak about how you created the rubric, like how you got started and what we, what we would have done differently um, had we have to go through it again? We began by identifying which schemes we had to come up with rubrics, like what, what configuration items did we want folks to be allowed to change in their, in their JIRA projects. Um, being a, a, very, a community, like basically everything was on the table um, initially. But we went with like, okay, going by some Atlassian um, advice and like, just like general internet, like community advice kind of things. Like we started with issue types first because that, that controls what fields you care about and what, um, like what status is, like what the workflow should be underneath. So we knew if we limited the number of issue types, we would in, you know, implicitly limit, also limit the number of custom fields and number of work, um, statuses and workflows we would need to. So we began with that and it started, um, the initial rubrics were just like, myself and the colleague just kind of like, free, like meeting one-on-one -on -one and just freehanding what we thought they should be. The way they get looked at is um, they don't have to meet every single criteria, but for every one that they do, that's like positive in, in their direction that it would get approved. Um, so we had some criteria in there that would be called out as like, if you don't meet this specific thing, then we're not doing it. Like that was true with the status one. Like if you're trying to rename, get out of here. Like don't bother evaluating the rest of this rubric. It's already, it's already a no. But there are other things that were a little bit softer in there, so it's like if they wanna, as I think for workflows, if you want me to use, if I could use an example there, if the workflow always is always like following the right status categories, like if it's to do, in progress, and done, as long as it's flowing in that right direction, then that's okay. But if it wasn't, like if there's a green status in the middle somewhere, like mm -mm, we're not doing that, we're not doing that kind of workflow because it's gonna mess up reporting. Um, does that help? Okay. Any other questions?
I only half heard that. Could you repeat? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, this will be my last question. So um, the question was, how did we get uh, how did we get to that organizational structure between standards and core? Um, when we rebooted it in January, we knew we were we still had like a backlog of, of things to evaluate as a governing body. So we knew we needed some form for that. So we kept the standards one. We just reduced how often it met. We didn't need to meet every week on that. So that was one thing. The core group was not just a bunch of uh, Jira admins. It was basically more opinionated people that had the time to put their opinions to action. <laughs> um, so we like. I had that conversation with a couple people where it's like every time something would come up, they'd have some opinions about it. I'm like, well, that's great. Like, I, I want to have that passion. But like, if you're going to keep dropping opinions in here, you got to do some of the work too. Um, and they did, thankfully. The core group was, it's, I would say like it was half Jira admins. We definitely had that team represented in there. Um, but they would work through, they were also like consultants to some extent. And I don't mean, consultants is the wrong word because that sounds like it's the role. They were, helping the other teams that were making requests understand and like doing the design with them. So if they needed like a flow through, um, like if they wanted a new workflow and we wanted to meet in the middle first, or if they wanted, they wanted to use a bunch of custom fields, and we had some, but we had like different names for them, that group, even though they're not JIRA admins, they have the visibility to be able to say like, this is the list of custom fields we have already, you should use these instead, and have that kind of like consulting sort of conversation. Um, and then once they had reached an agreement, then that would get to the JIRA admins who could actually do the the changes in the instance. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you everybody for your time. Thank you Elastine for having me.